Before we begin our work program today, I want to ask how many of you speak Chinese? By raising hand. How many? How many of you speak Spanish? So to make everybody feel better, we're going to use English as a medium to uh, communicate in this program. To give a brief introduction to the event, uh, I'd like to bring back some memories to a bridge conference. Uh, a, bridge, a bridge conference we had back then in 2008. Um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of you were able to join this conference back then as well and I, I think I saw Shanshan Korea. Shanshan? Shanshan used to be Korea and Korea. Shanshan used to be uh, part of the organization team back in 2008, right? Organizing 2009. Yeah, there you go. Like all, all the years back then we started already having these conferences already and uh, we're very lucky to have all the experts on the Tibetan issue today and uh, uh, without wasting any further time, we're going to begin with all the program right now. Um, for the first speaker, I would like to ask Mr. Hubing um, to give a little introduction on Mr. Hubing. He's, a, he's the chief editor of Beijing Screen. A poor democracy journal. Uh, Mr. Kubin went to Beijing University, received his master in Western philosophy. Uh, he also served as deputy China's National People's Congress. Uh, he began a good, he became a good friend with the Tibetan people in the 80s, right? And until now he has a strong support of the Tibetan cause. So I would like to ask him to share his thoughts, his um, experience in uh, get in touch with the Tibetan people and how he become so involved with the Tibetan cause. Hello,大家好。首先,感谢直诚教授先生组织这么一场汉藤交流会。那么这种交流活动我认为非常重要,也只有在自由的海外我们才能够进行这种交流。而在现在的中国还很难进行这样的交流，因此我们的交流就格外重要，因为我们可以把我们的交流的信息也传到国内去。I'd like to just first of all thank everyone, uh, thank everyone for coming, and uh, uh, right now uh, it is impossible in China to have this kind of conversation, so which is why I believe that it's especially important that us uh, in uh, outside of China uh, can have the really candid conversation on uh, this issue. Well, as a Han, I think we should try to understand the Chinese, understand the Chinese culture, understand their history. As a Chinese person, I believe that we should uh, uh, strive to understand the Tibetan culture, the history, as well as uh, 中国有句老话叫要得公道打颠倒用现代话讲叫换位思考 There is a Chinese there is a Chinese saying uh, which uh, if we translate it to English it would be uh, something along the lines of um, we have to put ourselves in other people's shoes 你想我们汉人 汉人在中国占百分之九十五以上，我们生活在汉人的亡羊大海之中，我们生活在汉人文化的亡羊大海之中，因此我们对很多事情就缺少感觉。So the Han Chinese make up make up approximately ninety five percent of the population in China, and we live we are we live in this so to speak. Uh, ocean of the Han Chinese uh, language, and uh, sometimes we lack the sensibility of other cultures uh, when we are immersed in this Han uh, majority culture. We don't understand 
，那些说着和我们不同的语言，和我们有不同的文化，有的甚至长相和我们都不太一样的人，他们在中国生活是什么样的感觉？ Uh, as a result,、uh, we don't, we, we can't、uh, understand how people who don't speak the language and even don't look the same as us,、uh, how they feel when they live in China. 嗯，很多这个华人都讲，呃，这越是到了外国，你才越觉得自己是中国人。呃、uh, ，a lot of Chinese people say that, uh, um, sometimes when you're you're outside of China, you start to realize that you're Chinese. 因为在海在外国，比如在美国，我们成了少数民族啊，因此我们的感受就和我们在中国的感受就变得非常不一样。那这是因为，当我们在海外，我们，名，汉族，我们成为少数民族，所以，当我们在海外，我们感觉到，在中国，我们感觉到，在中国，我们感觉到，在中国，我们感觉到，在中国，我们感觉到，在中国，我们感觉到，在中国，我们感觉到，又繁荣又富裕的，但是很多人中国在这里待着，他还是觉得不是很自在。呃、uh, ，In the United States,、uh, we have democracy, we have、uh, freedom, and、uh, it's a very wealthy country. But how?、Uh, but at the same time, sometimes we don't feel quite as、uh, we don't feel quite at home, and we don't feel quite at, at ease、uh, sometimes. 那原因很简单，就是因为我们在这里是少数民族。我们长得和他们不一样，我们说的话和他们不一样，我们很多生活习惯和他们不一样。And、this is because we're the minority and、uh, we don't look the same as the majority,、uh, and we have different、uh, lifestyles, and we have different language. 当然，如果你作为一个中国人，你也简单。如果你觉得这里你觉得不舒服，你可以回你中国去，那那一切问题就解决了。However,、uh, as a Chinese person, if you don't feel comfortable living here,、um, you have an easy solution. You can just simply go back to China and solve the problem. 但是你想想，在中国的这些少数民族，包括藏人，如果他们发现，在他们自己的家乡，啊，他们说自己的语言都遇到很大困难。如果你学不好汉语，你都不能找到很好的工作，那他们又作何感想？ However, as a Tibetan person, uh, uh, even in their homeland, they can't speak their own language, and、uh, if they don't speak、uh, Mandarin Chinese, they can't find a job, and、uh, things like that. And how would they feel in that situation? If these minority people find that in their homeland they are all minority, what would they feel? How would they feel、uh, if they found themselves? A minority in their own homeland. How would they feel? So we can understand why Chinese people have such a strong desire to live in China. This is how we can、uh, start to understand why the Tibetans want to have、uh, actual、um, autonomy in Tibet. Uh, past, uh, this Communist Party. 它是用一种意识形态进行统治，那么这种意识形态呢，强调阶级斗争，强调什么两条路线斗争。呃、uh, ，In the past, uh, the the uh, Chinese Communist Party uh, ruled uh, with the with the ideology. Um, they they focused on the class struggle and they they focused on ideology.、Yeah. 所以按照这种当时的统治呢。所谓就是亲不亲阶级分，亲不亲线上分，就是分成你们和我们，就看你是哪一个阶级的人，你是哪条路线的人，以前是按照这个来区分。So under the CCP rule, um, um, it's all be, it's all about whether we're in the same class. If we are close to each other, that, that's because we are in the same class.、Um, Uh, we're in the same class. We're friends. We're not enemies. 可是后来这种意识形态已经破产了，所以共产党后来就就鼓吹民族主义，把民族主义当成他的一个一种新的指导思想。However, that ideology is a bankrupt as of now, and therefore, right now, they are promoting、uh, this nationalism as their、uh, ideology. 可
可是，中共鼓吹的民族主义，实际上就是汉族主义。However, the so the so called nationalism is actually uh 汉族主义，就是汉对汉匈奴汉匈奴。你像我们讲什么炎黄子孙啦、啊，龙的传人啦、啊，又讲我们是什么这个儒家传统啦、啊，这些都是汉人的东西。Uh, they talk about the Yan Huang, so that we are descendants of the Yan and the Huang emperors, uh, and that uh, we are we are descendants of the dragon, um, as well as Confucianism well um, um, traditions. 可是人家藏人，人家有他们自己的神话，人家不是炎黄子孙，也不是龙的传人，人家也没有你的儒家儒家传统。However, the Tibetans, uh, they're, they're not descendants of the Yan and Huang emperors, and they're not uh, descendants of the dragon, uh, they have their own culture, and they're also not, uh, uh, the, the Confucianism is also not part of their uh, traditions. So when the, the CCP started to talk about this stuff, uh, how would the Tibetans feel? It, it seems like they're not really treating Tibetans as uh, them, part of themselves. 你像美国，它有很多的民族，但是它有自由民主人权这些普世价值，它是用这种普世价值把不同的人凝结在一起。In the United States, uh, there's uh, the universal human uh, values such as uh, democracy, freedom, um, and uh, human rights. It is these uh, universal uh, human values that unite the different cultures. Now, the CCP, they're promoting uh, the Han Shaolinism. And these traditions, they, they're not universal, they don't apply universally, and therefore, uh, as a result, uh, they necessarily um, kind of exclude uh, people of different traditions. This also shows um, that in China, uh, it, all, it also applies that only when we achieve democracy, uh, human rights, freedom, and these universal uh, values, uh, can we actually uh, achieve the goal to unite uh, all the different uh, uh, nationalities and ethnicities. Thank you, Mr. Bupi. Uh, for the next speaker, we have uh, Dr. Shah Ming. Uh, to give a little introduction of Dr. Shah Ming, Professor Shah Ming received his bachelor's and master's degree from the Department of International Politics, Udan University. Uh, he received his PhD degree from Temple University, where his dissertation won the Bernard Watson Best Dissertation Award in 1997. Uh, he was included in uh, to the top 100 Chinese public intellectuals of 2009 and 2010. Uh, he's a co-producer of HBO Oscar nominated documentary movie, China's Unnatural Disaster. Um, he just worked on, the, uh, worked on his first book about that and uh, he'll be speaking by welcome Mr. Uh, Professor Shang. Thank you. Um, I'm very happy to uh, tell you and the 16th anniversary of the Dalai Lama's uh, exile and also for the Tibetan community exile and so I just uh, got my book out uh, this month and the title is uh, Gao San Liu Shi High Peaks and the Flowing Rivers on Tibet and uh, I wanted to share with uh, many of you, especially young people uh, because when I'm aging and so I uh, always think about how the future is going to be uh, changed and is going to be created by and all of you and the, the, the young generation. So uh, one of the important questions is why I care about uh, Tibet and why I think uh, Tibet has uh, created a, a new horizon in my life. 
And then what kind of lessons I have learned, especially after I finished this book, and especially for the past 10 years, that I have uh, tried to understand Tibet through my interactions with a lot of uh, Tibetan friends and also uh, with His Holiness. The one important thing I want to say is uh, sometimes we, uh, the Chinese, uh, maybe we think, oh, we get involved, and that is because we can make a contribution to the Tibetan communities. And of course, the Tibetan communities would appreciate our help. And, but for me, I think and the most important thing is actually uh, I have learned a lot from the Tibetan communities, and not only in the United States, but all over the world. So through this book, you can find I have traveled to uh, different places, and uh, from Dar es and uh, to uh, uh, Scotland, Mockby, and uh, to uh, Barcelona, and also like uh, Wisconsin, Madison. And through all these travels and interactions with Tibetan uh, friends, I have realized uh, in the Chinese uh, civilization, Chinese culture, and the Han Chinese, and I think uh, we uh, do not have uh, some uh, learnings and uh, some ideas or education which we can easily find in the Tibetan teachings. Uh, especially when we talk about sympathy, empathy, and compassion. And uh, also, uh, when I started uh, learning about Tibet, I realized that uh, actually I entered a huge uh, uh, which we put it, uh, is kind of a huge uh, uh, building of learning. It's not something that's so simple, I can easily digest or I can easily understand. So I think not only uh, Tibetan Buddhism uh, is a huge uh, treasure, uh, but also Dalai Lama and, uh, himself and is a huge uh, treasure. And so that's why I uh, want to say, share this with you. Actually, I have been enriched through interacting with Tibetan culture, with Tibetan Buddhism. Uh, actually, eventually I was converted into Tibetan Buddhism. So this is why I think this is something uh, it is really uh, important and something for me uh, I take as a great blessing. And another thing I want to uh, talk about is uh, for many of you, uh, especially young people, and you are from the Chinese communities and also from the Tibetan communities, uh, one important thing is uh, when we think about uh, we are uh, like uh, Heidegger, and he once said, we have been thrown you see, uh, together. So we have no choices about where we are and who are going to be our neighbors. And so uh, under uh, such circumstances, we have to take each other uh, as you see, who we are. And so we have to work with a new future and a happier future and uh, with each other. So uh, my concern is not about if someday the Chinese communist uh, dictatorship is going to collapse and whether we are going to be in big trouble. I'm not really concerned about that because I'm sure once tyranny is gone and for uh, people who love liberty, and I'm sure we can build uh, a new country uh, together or maybe uh, several different countries together, but we can be in peace. So this is all. And I think uh, the issue is not about uh, whether and we are going to say the same the end of tyranny and whether we are going to have anarchy uh, once the tyranny is gone. And I think the concern is uh, you can find maybe tyranny is going to be gone. And maybe uh, we can kill the big dragon of tyranny, but then we are going to give birth to many poisonous snakes. And so this is how I believe an ethnic uh, splitism and the whole ethnic uh, division movements. I'm afraid that they are going to throw and the people not who are living in today's China, and uh, they are going to, I, I'm afraid, they are going to have conflicts with each other. This is my uh, top concern. Because why I have this concern? Uh, because uh, think about in China, as uh, just Mr. Hu uh, said, uh, we have the absolute majority of Han Chinese, and uh, it's about uh, 93, and uh, less than 93 percent. And uh, but uh, the minority uh, community say, uh, accounts for more than 60 percent of the territories in China. And so that big, you see, uh, the asymmetry uh, between the population and the uh, territory, I think, has complicated the issue. So if we are going to have a division of China into different parts, I am afraid it will be very difficult. Uh, because uh, not only the Chinese uh, already are living in the territories, today they are claimed by Tibetans and the Uyghurs and the Mongols, and, but also uh, you have to realize the territory or the Politically, today we are dealing with actually it was not 
created by the Chinese Communist Party alone. Actually, it was first created by Mongol Empire. And so if we think about uh, Chen Yuzhan, he was the first person to bring all of us together. And then we have Manchu Dynasty and the Manchu Empire also put us together. And also we have to remember under the Mongol Empire and also the Manchu Empire, actually the Tibetan uh, the Buddhism and the was uh, highly uh, respected. And the Tibetans enjoyed much, much higher social status than Han Chinese. And we can see the Tibetans were part of the super infrastructure on the Mongol Empire and the Manchu Empire. So if you want to understand this and just by watching the movie The Last Emperor, and I think the director just passed away right, just uh, last uh, month. And so if you uh, watch this movie, you can find uh, the three important uh, occasions and the Tibetan Buddhism and the camp into the scenes. And the one is when uh, Chi Shi, uh, the Empress Dowager, when, he, uh, when she died. And so you can see how the Tibetan Lamas and the camp and the Tibetans. And when the young emperor uh, uh, Pu Yi was uh, brought into the royal palace, the forbidden city, and you can see the uh, uh, Tibetan Lamas come again. And then when the Pu Yi and was running away from the uh, forbidden city, and you can see also, and he passed through the Lamas. And then the, the last time and the, in the movie you can find Wen Pu Yi and the words you see the, uh, about to become the new emperor for the Manzhou Guo and the, you can find the ceremony and the, for the enthroned uh, the process and the words you see are conducted by the Tibetan Lamas. So what I want to say is uh, I think and we should have a, a long term and historic understanding that in this uh, uh, long uh, historic process about uh, some 800 years and I think and the Tibetans and Chinese and the Han Chinese and we were put together and uh, basically it's not a, a simple uh, issue that is one ethnic group to conquer another ethnic group but actually we were, you see, uh, thrown together and so also the history I think was created more by the non-Chinese and uh, than by the Chinese under Mongol Empire and the uh, Manchu Empire and so this is how I think and, uh, we don't have to uh, carry this burden of victimhood too, you say, the serious thing. And also, I don't think the Han Chinese and the Shu carry the guilt uh, too seriously. Because I think uh, for the Han Chinese, of course, the Han Chinese and the Chinese Communist Party have done a lot of uh, wrong things towards the Tibetans. But I think uh, for the history, and uh, we cannot just only focus on only one sec uh, section of the history. And so uh, I think uh, we should realize and for the past uh, 1,000 years, of course, the Chinese history or the uh, territory now is called uh, China and has been full of injustices. But it's just like in every avalanche, right? every slow uh, flake is responsible for the final result. So that's how I think that if we understand that, and uh, so we should understand the relationship a bit better. But it does not mean uh, that I uh, uh, only uh, think about this uh, negative uh, impact or meaning, but I also think about the uh, positive uh, meaning uh, from my reading of history. That is the history of today's China, and it's not only you see created by the Han Chinese. So the uh, Han Chinese cannot uh, claim the exclusive uh, dominant subject uh, place in history. Actually, uh, we have uh, different or multiple subjects including Mongols, including Tibetans, including Manchus. So this is how I think and we have multiple players and we have multiple narratives for today's Chinese history. There is no only one official single narrative controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. So if that's the uh, uh, historic development, I think for all of us, and we should feel we are empowered and to take today's China into our own hand, so everyone should participate and we can co partake in making the future history of China. And so I think that this is what we are going to be doing together. And also, I want to say a few things for the Han Chinese. And I think it's important for us to understand that if we think about Tibet, that at this moment, there are three major issues and we should understand. We should need a lot and a more objective and a balanced understanding and so the first issue, of course, and it's about uh, Dalai Lama. Who is the Dalai Lama? 
and uh, so uh, how we are going to uh, evaluate and Dalai Lama as a leader and as a great thinker and in today's global civilization. If you understand Dalai Lama, and I think you should understand the, the, the Tibetan uh, history and the Tibetan future much, much better. So I hope and the, for uh, the Chinese and Han Chinese, and I hope that uh, if you can read uh, uh, any one book written by uh, the Dalai Lama and or uh, watch a movie about him, and so I think you can have a different understanding. So this is the first uh, issue. The second issue is uh, for the past, especially for the past 10 years, of course, uh, uh, for the past almost uh, uh, three or four decades, uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama has advocated the middle way approach. And the middle way approach is to uh, acknowledge the sovereignty and the, of the, uh, uh, the sovereignty of China, and not to seek uh, independence of Tibet uh, from uh, China, but uh, to seek genuine autonomy from China. So I think this middle way approach, and uh, we should understand this is a really and a, a solemn uh, pledge, and from His Holiness on behalf of the Tibetan people to the Chinese people, to the Han Chinese. So I don't think this is like a surrender, a compromise that Dalai Lama has proposed and to you see, the, the, the Chinese Communist Party. And if you read and if you listen to uh, Dalai Lama, you understand that Dalai Lama has uh, less and less his hope and, uh, about the Chinese Communist Party. But he has uh, uh, increased his hope about the Chinese people. So I hope and as a Han Chinese, and we should understand the middle approach, and so we should understand even someday and, uh, our future history may be uh, in uh, chaos, and uh, maybe at the historic moment and uh, the ethnic tensions are going to run high. But I hope and we understand the middle approach, we understand the uh, solemn pledge from the Tibetans to the Han Chinese, I hope we are going to avoid uh, bloodshed and uh, human tragedies. Then the third, and means that Lama is in uh, his uh, 80s. Uh, so it means now the reincarnation issue has become a big uh, topic and, uh, among the Tibetan communities, also in the uh, Tibetan and Chinese uh, uh, relationship. So I want you to, to understand and, uh, this reincarnation, and it's uh, something uh, which, is, uh, which has a long historical and religious tradition, and which is based upon individual cultivation of mind. And so I think as an atheist uh, communist party, and uh, especially uh, as a secular uh, political power, they have no uh, place uh, in uh, deciding who is going to be the next reincarnate. So I hope at, the, at this moment, all the Han Chinese and we should be very much aware and there is no legitimacy for the Chinese government an atheist and communist government and to determine and who the future leader and the will be and for the Tibetan religion. So this is what I hope and when you to in your mind. And the fourth issue I want to mention is also all these four issues, they are the uh, topics in my book that is about uh, self-immolation. And uh, I think for the Han Chinese and we have to uh, develop our sympathy and in within China, they have as they uh, resort to self immolation to express their uh, uh, suffering and also and their uh, uh, longing for the return of uh, His Holiness Dalai Lama. And I think uh, the self immolation, uh, it happened and in a way to try to say, appeal to the Han Chinese. Because this, you say, uh, has meaning uh, only because the spectators are going to pay attention. It means under the Han Chinese, if we pay attention and if we wish for our sympathy and our empathy, then all these heroic acts they have to be. But unfortunately, now if we calculate, and since the year 2009, and we have witnessed more than 100, I think it's 155 now, yeah, more than 155 uh, Tibetans uh, have safe humiliations uh, within uh, the people's Republic of China. So this is what I think and for all of us, and uh, you, you just imagine, uh, especially people who uh, mentioned, and you have to step into the shoes of uh, many other people, right, or better people, you just think about, in any country, any civilization, any religion, if you have group people, and uh, think about, if we have, uh, say, uh, five nuns, right, ten Catholics, and uh, so ten Arabs, right, and the Jews, they're going to commit suicide because of religious persecution. What's going to happen? 
and I'm sure the whole world is going to be on fire. But unfortunately, now we have this scene for the past is almost 10 years, and 155 Tibetans already, and they, they say the system is on fire. But unfortunately, this whole world, and especially the Chinese communities, have been so cold-hearted. And I think this carelessness itself and, uh, should be overcome by all of us. Therefore, we can become uh, better human beings. So this is why and I think uh, these uh, four issues at this moment, and we should think about a better understanding. Last uh, sentence I want to say, and for the journey and, uh, and, uh, of my interaction with Tibetans and with His Holiness, and especially this book, this book is a result of my 10 years of thinking and reflection, and uh, also learning from the Tibetan communities. And so I think I've learned, let's say, a, a one a big lesson. The big lesson is, especially for many of you, and some of you are yeah, uh, still in college. And so when uh, I were, uh, was young, and uh, just like uh, actual age, I always was very ambitious about I should be very knowledgeable. I should be like an uh, encyclopedia. So I should uh, learn everything. I should know everything. So this was my ambition. So I think yeah, I worked very hard. I studied very hard. Uh, I think I was always a good student. And in my uh, 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 high school, college, or graduate years. Uh, but until you see, I left college, uh, until I uh, uh, entered my uh, middle life, as I realized knowledge is not uh, enough for us to steer through the difficulty, uh, difficulties in our life. Uh, so I realized that sometimes uh, when you uh, are dealing with all kinds of crises, Especially when you are dealing with uh, a lot of moral uh, judgments, uh, moral you see, uh, dilemmas. Because in our uh, uh, world you can find the choice is not uh, uh, between what's right and what's wrong. The choice is always between what is right, what is good, what is bad, what is better, what is worse. Right? So we have many, many choices. Sometimes and we are going to sacrifice and the small good and for bigger good. Sometimes, maybe we are going to say, avoid the bigger evil by committing a smaller evil, a lesser evil. So this is how we can find that uh, our choice is more like a sophist choice. It's not an absolute either, either or choice. So this is what I believe that now we need wisdom. And because we don't have complete uh, knowledge to guide our choice, so we need wisdom. So what is wisdom? And wisdom, I think, is our experiences and our interaction with people, and uh, uh, is beyond uh, our reading of books because life is changing, life is more dynamic. But only when we have wisdom, so we become wise, and I don't think it's going to be enough for us to deal with the challenges, especially moral challenges in our world. And so I think, and eventually, we are going to uh, think about if our life is like a rocket, and we need the three stages to see energy. And uh, to prepare our life and to reach our destiny. So I think the, the third stage is that we have to embrace truth. So when we if you think about what is truth, truth can make our life much much easier. And because and, uh, when we are dealing with the complexities in our human life, sometimes our gut feeling and our first reaction is, oh, this is not right. Right, this is something is wrong. And uh, therefore, I'm not going to do it. Even the temptation can be very strong. Even materialistic reward that can be huge. And uh, so you can find, and uh, at this moment, many people, including many friends of mine, and they have been uh, 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 snapped and into the net of uh, uh, untruthfulness and or injustice. And uh, so why? Because I think uh, many people cannot say the. Uh, uh, stop themselves from uh, being uh, tempted. So I think uh, the last stage is we are going to have the simple truth and we are going to embrace. So what is simple truth? I think and from uh, learning uh, from Dalai Lama and impacting with Tibetan people, I think the simple uh, truth is compassionate and it's love and it's non-violence, it's peace. So this is how I think and if we always keep this simple truth as the foundation of our life, we can make a better judgment. This is what I learned. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Shami. Uh, next speaker we have Mr. Ding Yi Wu. Mr. Ding is an expert on international relationship and Tibetan issue. He 
is a famous writer in American politics as well. Okay. And he's working on uh, translating uh, the book of Tibetan uh, and Monday Life Conferences. And he'll be speaking of Buddhism and science. So please welcome Mr. Lee. First, I want to take a uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Social Media Council, Mr. Social Media Council, because of his uh, dedication to this conference. This is the first time uh, to this kind of conference where there's so many young people attending uh, this conference. So this year is the year of 2019, and uh, uh, Mr. Sotong uh, Gyatso, he is the Chinese liaison in the Tibet office, uh, office of Tibet, and uh, that is because when we put uh, this event into the uh, entire history, 60 years of history of the uh, Tibetan Muslim exile, um, uh, is the, the fourth generation of Tibetans in the exile. Okay, the first generation were the, um, were the people who followed the Dalai Lama uh, from the uh, went from uh, Tibet to India and uh, they consist of some of the older uh, I guess gentry uh, nobilities uh, in Tibet. Yeah, uh, and uh, uh, this is the list of the nobilities in Tibet. Okay, I'll be getting into too many details. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. But at that time, 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 that for the first generations, um, it, to to use one word to encapsulate uh, uh, this whole experience is survival. Yeah. Uh, there um, so it was, it was very difficult of, uh, in their uh, journey from uh, Tibet to India, and a lot of people even died on this journey. Uh, but uh, at the time, the, uh, the Dalai Lama, His Holiness, he was only in his 20s. However, he was able to lead this group of uh, you know, nobilities and to uh, settle down in India uh, and to build uh, all kinds of infrastructure uh, such as uh, schools, hospitals, orphanage, uh, and in, in the end uh, they were able to survive. Uh, at the time, uh, the entire world thought that you know uh, the issue is has already it's already a bygone issue, but it's it's no longer an issue in existence. 
呃，在第一代我们还可以看到一件非常艰难的，就是达赖喇嘛一直要流亡了二十年以后才第一次来到美国。Uh, it was only after the Dalai Lama was in exile for 20 years uh, was the Dalai Lama the first time in the United States. 但是呢，经过了二十年的流亡以后，就产生了第二代的流亡的领袖，那就是一些啊、呃，我们我们那个流亡史上有些大名鼎鼎的人物，那就像桑东仁波切和丁仁波切，他们在流亡的时候才二十来岁，经过二十年到他们四五十岁，那就是。And uh, after 20 years, there came the second generation of Tibetans in exile. Um, and um, there was a number of reproaches. <laughs> <laughs> they, um, uh, they followed the Dalai Lama uh, to, uh, to India, and they were also in their 20s. And um, after that, they become a second generation. OK, <laughs> let's, let's say, uh, design that. 第三代就是现在的啊，我们以前打交道的，像那个贡嘎扎西先生啊，我们那个现在的师尊罗桑桑根先生，他们就是第三代。第三代是达赖喇嘛开创了流亡社区民族文化的一代。And then the third generation includes some of the friends that we know, including Mr. Kungatashi and、uh, Mr. Losang. Losang Sangke. Losang Sangke. Uh, and uh, they are the they represent the generation where Dalai Lama started to um, uh, follow democracy uh, in uh, in Tibet. Now, the third generation, like Mr. Wang Zhangxi, has reached the white hair and has reached the retirement age. Now, the fourth generation comes out. The fourth generation is going to open the new era of Dalai Lama's rule. Now. Uh, 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 Mr. Kungatashi, uh, uh, he already do, has some <laughs> gray hair, <laughs> and uh, so now it's a new era for the Tibetans in exile. So, to the present day, 2019, this Liu Wang 60 years, the time, if we want to understand the Liu Wang history, we will think: what did the Liu Wang people do in the past 60 years? If we uh, really try to study the his 60 year history of uh, Exactly. We can't help but wondering what、uh, have they done? What were they doing in the 60 years? This is what I today want to say. That we outsiders generally don't know about the Liu Wang people who have experienced these things. Among them, there are also those who don't understand the Dalai Lama's actions. And this leads to my today's topic, which is because of which is. Because of the, uh, you know, the, the, the out people from outside the world didn't understand, you know, what the Tibetan people in exile were doing and how, what they experienced, and also including what the Dalai Lama has done in the 60 years. Uh, 如果你在我们现在在互联网上，如果你呃呃谷歌一下，呃，达赖喇嘛 ，Dialogue with scientists, you will find a huge, huge, lot of material. <laughs> so if you just Google now, Dalai Lama is dying of his scientists will find a lot of search results. Dalai Lama from 70s to the start, when he first met with the West, 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 uh, ever since the Dalai Lama uh, first time uh, sort of came out of the, 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 the Tibet, the, the, the exile community, uh, he, he was uh, in Europe uh, the first time in 1973, and uh, his first time in the United States was 1979. He was always looking for scientists to uh, have dialogue with. Yeah. And uh, 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 he 非常有意思、非常奇怪的一点就是，西方科学家一旦和达赖喇嘛谈过话以后，就都想谈第二次，还要谈第三次。There is this strange phenomenon uh, where as soon as the Western scientists have had a dialogue with the Dalai Lama and his holiness, they always wanted to have a second chance or third chance. 对。
。然后呢，西方科学家和达赖喇嘛谈，当然是介绍西方科学。我们知道，现代科学那是多么伟大、多么高深的那些学问。达赖喇嘛是没有受过现代学校教育的，但是他能理解。嗯、uh, ，so when the the Western scientists uh, uh, are talking, they always talk about the Western uh, science, the very profound knowledge that. Uh, um, handed down to to the modern society, uh, and the uh, Dalai Lama he never he was never educated uh, in the Western way, and he never had Western scientific education. Um, but he but he studied, yeah. but he understood. Yeah. Uh, we can see that Dalai Lama. Yeah, Dalai Lama has a book called "A Universe in a Single Atom." There's a book by the Dalai Lama. Universe in a single atom. Atom, yeah. This is he talking about this process. Then, the scientists want to hear what Dalai Lama is talking about. Of course, Dalai Lama is talking about Buddhism, Buddhism. And the Dalai Lama talked to the scientists about Buddhism and the wisdom of Buddhism. Uh, we, 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 也就是说，佛教里面有有一些非常庞大科学知识在里头，这个就是达赖喇嘛的讲。In Chinese, there's there are two terms,、uh, Buddhism as well as the study of Buddhism, and、um, there's a whole wealth of knowledge、uh, in, in these、uh, areas. 呃，到了那个呃上个世纪八九十年代的时候，就有一些科学家。他们觉得，趁着达赖喇嘛到西方来访问的时候，谈两天，一般他们谈话一次谈两天，时间太短，所以呢，他们结果就组队，一组到达兰萨拉去，到印度达赖，呃，达赖喇嘛住的地方去，这样来谈，每一次他们可以谈五天到六天。Uh, Uh, however, later on, they decided to uh, uh, go to Dharamsala and uh, and live there and to talk to Dalai Lama for for five days at a time. Uh, 非常可惜的就是那个时候的谈话都是达赖喇嘛和科学家的私下的对话，从来没有在媒体上公布过，从来不邀请媒体，所以呢也没有人报道过。但是呢，呃，科学家们在谈话以后。呃，有时候会出一本专著来记录这个废话的内容。这些书现在在 Amazon 里面还能看，还能看，特别容易。呃、uh, ，There was a shame back then of the、uh, Dalai Lama's conversations with the scientists were usually conducted in private, and there were no、uh, journalists or, or reporters、uh, from the media were invited to these conversations.、Um, Uh, however, a lot of these scientists they would publish a book、um, after they had these conversations with Dalai Lama to、uh, to record what was、uh, talked about during these conversations. And a lot of these books are available now on Amazon. And Dalai Lama in Yellow, has used five days to talk about Buddhism, to talk about Buddhism with the Western people. There was one time the Dalai Lama spent five days. To talk about Buddhism at Yale University uh, uh, to uh, to Western audience. 然后呢，所以到了二零零三年的时候，科学家方面就提出，我们科学家和佛学的对话在 MIT 举行。Uh, in two thousand three, there was a uh, uh, dialogue between scientists and Buddhists at MIT. 所以这是第一次达赖喇嘛和科学家公开的在西方公开谈话，有成千的学生和教师旁听了这次对话。And this was the first time that the Dalai Lama publicly discussed、uh, to have a dialogue publicly with the Western scientists, and there were thousands of students and professors, teachers that were in the audience. 然后到了呃二零一三年初的时候，他们那呃从此以后就是每年
科学家和都都都和呃达赖喇嘛会举行对话，参加过和达赖喇嘛对话的科学家，我统计了一下有几百个。Uh, after that,、uh, every year,、um, this after that this became a yearly event. So the Dalai Lama would, you know, talk to the scientists, and I ha I have、um, sort of、uh, calculated there are about there were hundreds of scientists who who has had、uh, this kind of、uh, conversations. 然后呢，还有一个很有趣的一个事件发生，就是二零一三年的时候，达赖喇嘛把这次对话。在南印度的泽邦市，就是藏传佛教最大的寺院，在那儿举行，让喇嘛们来旁听他和科学家的对话。In 2013, the Dalai Lama had a very uh, huge uh, uh, dialogue with scientists、uh, at one of the biggest、uh, temples in Tibet.、Uh, in South India. South India. Uh, the Bang <laughs> Temple. <laughs> Um, uh, and where there were a lot of lamas that were、um, also、uh, listening in. Uh, that conversation, I was very happy to attend. It was a very moving event. You can imagine that there were about 7,000 lamas, all wearing red robes, watching the big screen, watching the broadcast of the television. It was very moving. I had the honor to be there.、Uh, And to be listening to His Holiness, in,、uh, along with seven thousand lamas,、uh, it was a very、uh, grand scene. That is, I saw, I saw the Dalai Lama and the scientists' conversation. This is, I, I say, this is the most important thing. It 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 is the most important thing. 他们在那儿谈六天，他们是怎么谈的？这个我在当场看了以后，我觉得整个的改变了。Uh, so this uh, experience changed my life. This experience where, um, um, you know, the, the pinnacle of Western uh, science, the, who has the the up, utmost knowledge of、uh, Western science, to to have a dialogue. With、uh, someone from,、uh, from a religious leader, from the East,、uh, and have a dialogue for sixty days, for sorry, for six days, and this、uh, this event just completely changed my life. So, from this, we every time, the Dalai Lama Jinzhe and the scientists have a dialogue. Only there is possible to sit there and listen. We are privileged. This is a very wonderful learning opportunity. So, ever since then.、Uh, As long as there is any opportunity to,、uh, with, uh, to listen to His Holiness's dialogue with Western scientists,、uh, I would uh, I would uh, participate. It's a very、uh, valuable opportunity to learn. Yeah. 然后去年呢，我和呃江林，我们就把达赖喇嘛和西方科学家三十年对话的这个过程，呃，写了一本书，就是整个过程写了一本书。我觉得这是。呃，非常非常，就是说，对我们来讲，就是，呃，我们也处在一个一个历史时刻，这个能够有幸见证这么了不起的事情。Um, so last year, uh, Miss Jenny Lee and me, uh, we wrote this book to, uh, uh to record, uh, the t h i r years of Dalai Lama's dialogue with scientists. And、uh, we are very, we are honored to be in this historical moment to witness uh, such uh, a great exchange of, of wisdom. Okay, 最后我就想讲呃讲一下这个呃达赖喇嘛和科学家对话的意义的这个结论。Now I wanted to talk about the,、uh, the meaning of、uh, the dialogues between the Dalai Lama and the scientists. 达赖喇嘛是藏民族在当代产生的一个一个非常开明的领袖。七十年前，当达赖喇嘛正式执政的时候，就是、就是正式把政治权力交给他的时候，他就想改革藏民族。
改革藏人社会。Even since 70 years ago, when uh, the power was handed over uh, to the Dalai Lama, he had already formed the idea to uh, reform uh, the traditional Tibetan society. 但是呢，后来占领了西藏的，呃，就是中国政府，中国共产党，对于西藏人要走什么道路，有另外一种想法，就是阻止了达赖喇嘛的这个改革计划。这个达赖喇嘛在他的自传里。However, um, after the, the after Tibet was uh, later invaded by the Chinese Communist Party, uh, they had their own idea of how to rule this this land, and uh, uh, as a result, uh, his, his Holiness's plan was uh, foiled. Yeah. 等到现在流亡六十年以后，我们就可以比较清楚的看到了达赖喇嘛改革西藏的藏人社会的这个方向是。Uh, but right now, after 60 years, we could already see very clearly how the Dalai Lama had envisioned for the for the reform of Tibetan societies. He in the Tibetan society, the Tibetan exile society, made the political system He had uh, democratized uh, the political uh, policies in the uh, political systems. 他用向寺院推广科学教育这个方法，来试图让西藏的社会在一定程度上的世俗化。Uh, he tried to, in a way, uh, uh, transform the, 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 the Tibetan uh, temples uh, uh, to make them a little more uh, secular. Secularize. Secularize Tibetan temples by teaching them modern science. Then he tried to modernize the Tibetan culture. And he also tried to make the education of Tibetans. Uh, he, he tried to make science a big part of the education of Tibetan. 而作为像我这样的人，作为一个一个汉人的一个学生，啊，跟着达赖喇嘛来学的话，我们就我就觉得这个藏文化和他的领袖达赖喇嘛实在是太了不起了。Uh, so as a as a student of His Holiness, as a Han Chinese student of His Holiness. I sincerely feel, feel that uh, the Tibetan culture and the His Holiness are just so great. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Uh, next speaker, we have Mr. Zhao to give a brief introduction about Mr. Zhao Lin. She was graduated from Buddha University. She then received her master's degree in Jewish history and library science from Brandeis University and Queen's College, respectively. Um, since 2004, she started her research on tobacco, and then after years of research, she has written many books. And one of the books uh, that is well known to the Tibetan study and to work right now, and it called uh, Pasana Dipitina Tibetan Agony. Uh, this book was translated by the Cambridge Harvard University Press later. It became a well-known book and the uh, uh, reference of Tibetan issue. Um, so without much further ado, uh, let me welcome Ms. Lee Jiang Lin. She will be speaking about why Tibetan modern history is important for Chinese and Tibetan students. Thank you. Uh, this is the part of Tibetan language with my daughter. Around your age, and every time I met her, she always said the same thing. First of all, Mom, don't lecture me. So I'm not here to lecture. And um, we have, in my family, we have a very good joke. I always say, as a historian, I always say this is this. This is how I look at things. And my husband is here, and we always say, as the husband of a historian, this is my opinion. So we have a team. He was talking about Tibetan exile. What my study is, I have 
of you. Uh, that's before that time. So for us, we always has a like a teamwork. He will talk about always one of the life what he can do during the day. I will always talk about what makes Tibetans into him. So when you, when you see our team here together or anywhere, that's always what we'll talk about. Okay, why is it important to know history? Sorry, it sounds like a lecture again. But what I'm trying to say, basically, what made me to study Tibetan history. Um, before I studied about Tibetan history, I studied Jewish Empire. And there was something inside of me looking at uh, life as a journey, and a journey including exile, in a way. And there is also a way how you deal with immense pressure that changed your life, you were tossed around, and how you face it, how you deal with it. And it is symbolically, it's, you can always say that it's like intellectual. Sometimes you are on the edge when you think, when you look at reality, whatever you were taught by professors, like Shani, no negative way. And sometimes it, well, it doesn't match, like the way we were brought up, right? We were brought up in the setting communist ideology, they tell you class struggle, so on and so forth, so they give you a picture of uh, heaven on earth, so on. And then we start to look at reality, that cultural revolution we sitting here experienced. The education the reality didn't match. You intellectually you were on exile. Because that's not true. And I will not pass out of that belief system. Where am I going? And uh, that was a time I saw the first time in my life after the Cultural Revolution, I was intellectually on exile because whatever was given to me, including my life experience, uh, born into and born up in a communist uh, family. It's all crumbled. I'm left on my own. Intellectually, I have to look. I'm looking for something to hold myself together so I can, I can survive this intellectual exile. That is how I, um, as my first degree is in um, American history of American literature. My second degree, uh, my first degree is English language, my second degree is American literature. They didn't tell me how I, they didn't give me a guide to go through this exile and hold myself together. So I went to history. And the history of, in at Brandeis University, I started to find out why history is so important. Because as an individual, me being here, you being here, he being here, is all the result of history. What happened before us made us as individual and as a society. If you want to see why we are here, the society like this, looking back, what you did you here, why you are sitting here, us find out what happened in the past. As like my daughter was born here, we saw the ABCs, why you were born here, not in China, ask your parents, what happened, why they come here. They must, you will find a whole bunch of family history that connected to society, that connected to times, and you go further down uh, another stage, another stage that will lead you to reality. And the time, then, now, and here. So, how I started. Why I end up from Jerusalem to Dalai It's the first time I met in 1999. My intellectual exile wasn't ended yet. 
I was getting a little better because I started understanding more about the past and uh, why I'm here, but I was still searching. And that was very good. If, uh, it was lucky that it was, at that time we were in, uh, in I was what people would call, um, what do we say that? Um, internet and the age. Meaning, that was pre-Windows. And what we are, we were able to connect with people internationally uh, through maybe this, probably the way before you people. And somebody from Germany sent me a link. That was a link here, to send me an email, a um, uh, message from the mailing list, where we the Buddhist mailing list. And he said, hey, that one is going to Central Park. That was 1999, summer, or August 15th. I said, why don't you come take a look? And I was almost suddenly remember whatever I was taught about Tibet, backwards, dark, um, barbarians, everything. But I had a lot of, lot of things floating down in a newspaper, TV, or whatever. But I didn't know what Dharma is, who he is, what he is, what he looked like, everything. And I'm purely out of curiosity and went and it was a long line. And somehow I went in and got that experience. That was the history that brought me here. And uh, I don't, we don't have I don't have to like, describe that power that shattered that part of the shadow like beyond in my mind. It was like I'm sure you all know when you you can't really uh, out of the drawing out of the darkness in the room, all you need to do is light a candle, right? That was a candle lit in part of my mind that would remain a dark. So, out of curiosity, um, drew me into the world. You want to know what Tibet culture is? Is it really uh, what I've taught about the barbarians and so on? So, some great. And it's a whole, whole new world open to me. And uh, I go further down until five years later, 2004, I met him in person. And there was another powerful power to me. Uh, you can actually feel the energy, and the compassion is an energy you can actually feel. It. And that pushed me another, another way uh, forward. So three years later, 2007, I went to Dar and so most people go to Dar they just go to Dar and then get Dar and come back. But, you know, I'm always curious about uh, what the air that is about. So some people say, why don't you go to South India? So I went to South India to get a settlement. And when I went there, it was like, wow. So there's no back return. So, and from here, I want to say, the question is, why they are on exile. And the research is always started with something very simple and straightforward, and there's no need to go um, start with this computation. My first question is why they are on exile. The second question is why, what pushed them out of Tibet? So I started from trying to answer these two questions, I went deeper and deeper and deeper into history. And that was the book I, 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 I wrote, published um, a, a few more books, but research is fun from from what I finished. Uh, actually, my research covered only 15 years. That is from 1950 to 1965. 1950 is the year um, Tibet and China signed the agreement. Uh, commonly known as the 17 points agreement. 15, uh, 1965 was the year um, what we know as today as Tibet Autonomous Region was formally founded. And this 15 years created what the Tibetan issues as we know today and the Tibetan Exile Society, etc., Dynamas Exile. And everything we can do, uh, we know, basically, it was produced in 15 years. 
and I spent 15 years of my life so far to study this continuous. And uh, this, is, this is just my, uh, a brief introduction about my research and why history is important and why history uh, is worth studying. It's boring. Um, I always complain to my husband and say, in my next life, I don't want to be sorry. Because uh, I'm going to go through thousands, I, I mean thousands and thousands of materials that are so boring, I hate to read it. You go statistics, and uh, in May, especially um, if I want to be a happy historian, I would like to study something like the history of coffee. And uh, you know, this looks like that. That would be much more interesting. But you study this part of Tibetan history, modern Tibetan history, in that 15 years, give you depressions, give you anger, give you tears, give me sometimes, and uh, I start becoming showing signs of him, you know, depression, and I start to become silent a few days, my husband is going to say, What's going on? What have you been reading? And uh, you know, he has to drag it to all this, but this is still a person. It holds me together as a Han Chinese and uh, make me really, I would say, my spiritual exile, intellectual exile, and it because of this research gave me the meaning of my existence and gave me, made my sense of justice has some way you can anchor it. I know it's easy for us to say, I want to be a compassionate person, I know I have a lot of sense of justice, but it has to fall down on something. It has to be rooted. And the different people root on different things, but for me, research. And uh, I end up in one sentence that's uh, one of my, before I wrote my book, the second book that's called When I Bird Flies, uh, The Secret War in, on Tibetan Plateau in, from 1956 to 1962. And I had a long interview with his Highness. So when, when this ended, when the interview ended, he told us to hold my hand Remember, the reason you want to do this research is you want to look for historical truths. Not because you want to support me or you want to support the Tibetan cause. It's you want to find out the Tibetan cause. Uh, you want to find out the historical cause. And you always trust the power of truth. And the power of truth is so powerful that you need to find it. It really did. Develops a lot of energy to do that. And it's also worth doing that, no matter whatever cost, personal cost, you may have to pay. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Jami. Hopefully, in the future, this story of Tibet will bring some coffee for us. <laughs> um, for the next speaker, uh, we have Mr. Nunga Chashi. Um, Give a little bit. Sorry, I can't find my. Oh, yeah. I'm not going to look at it. I'm just going to go straight. So, Mr. Mumbajaji, he came from Center to Bad Administration. He used to be the, um, he used to be my predecessor who brought me into this uh, circle of Center to Bad uh, dialogue. And he's currently working as Bad Fund as a Center to Bad Analyst. And he will be speaking on middle approach of Tibet, and I'm going to ask Sanchan to translate again.
三十三年，在藏联行政怎么样？都已通知了所说的，在西藏我们不碰头。First of all, I would like to thank Mr. Sosham Nagyatso for organizing this event. I'm very, especially very, very happy to see all the young faces in the audience. So I, this is because I was actually born in Lhasa, and I went to India, the exile settlement in India. Um, and it has been over 30 years uh, since I was in this um, administration. Uh, 
其他人所讲的话，也不断地要去了解各个的想法，这样才能够掌握到真实的信息。Uh, this is not to say you must、uh, believe in any one person, be it Tibetan or, or Chinese,、uh, but you have to listen to、uh, various different voices and to find out their own truth. 所以在不了解情况的时候，有的时候各位也许会觉得，如果套一句中国政府的话，各位可能会觉得我也是一个他们所谓的打败集团的一份子，也许会觉得我是一个分裂主义者。嗯，所以 ，it's possible that、uh, you might、uh, think that I am also、uh, One of the、um, separatists from the uh, the Dalai clique, clique、uh, to 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 use the, the language and use by the、uh, the Chinese government. 呃，如果说各位有这样的看法，身为一名藏人，我也绝不在意，因为这是环境所造成。所以在这个情况之下，我们这样的过程当中，你就了解。打败了吗？是不是一种分裂者？在海外的障碍，境内的障碍，是不是像中国政府所形容的那么样恐怖？从点点意义上，你可以了解这些。嗯、um, ，even if some of you still believe that I'm a separatist,、uh, I, I, it doesn't really matter to me as long as you learn as through opportunities like this to to learn uh, uh, whether the Dalai Lama. His Holiness is actually a separatist, and what he actually promotes. 呃，如果是这样的话，在几年前，刚刚促进在开场的时候，他们我们召开了一个以哥伦比亚大学中国学生为主的一个桥梁团会，在桥梁团会上，今天在场的传法博士、翻译的珊珊，还有我们的黄小雪。都不会今天来这，而且为我们做饭。如果是分裂，你们也不能也分裂。His Holiness Dalai Lama, he was, he were a、uh, separatist.、Uh, some of the Chinese、um, friends here, including me,、uh, and.、Um, Ms. Wang Xiaoxiao and、uh, Mr. Chen Chuanchuan,、uh, they wouldn't have been here today. The, 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 the bridge conference、uh, was、uh, in partnership with Columbia University here a, a few years ago. Uh, when we met the first time, she was young and beautiful. She was still young for a few years. <笑>所以，从这个情况来说，为什么感到高兴？原因就这个样子。那我刚刚说，提了几个例子，说我们不是分裂者。那这个从我们的政策立场上。来证明我们并不是想西藏合一主义，所以有些人刚刚拿了个绿本书，这就是中间道路政策的来源去。那我把呃用很简单的方式把中间道路政策用简单的向各位做一个很简单的报告。呃，刚刚呃几位。那个学者谈到很多关于西藏的一些情况，这些都是他们亲眼目睹所下的一个结论。那一九五九年，塔赖喇嘛跟部分藏人
，李焕英女士说，即从一九五九年到一九七四年，我们所争取的是民主西方。一九五九年到一九七四年。Um, like uh, the, the few scholars uh, just reported, uh, based on their own research, um, uh, we maintain that from uh, 19, 1959 to 1974, uh, we had uh, uh, tried to uh, sort of restore the, the independence of Tibet. 当时就有这个想法，那这个想法也不是达赖喇嘛他一个人擅自做决定。当时的很多那个西西藏的官员，还有国务的议员讨论之后，我们觉得今后我们要走一个真正的自己，民命无保，走这么一个路，对藏民族好，对汉民族好。所以从一九七四年就有了中间党。Uh, and this decision wasn't uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, his own decision. Uh, it was a decision that uh, he had uh, came to after consulting with a lot of um, uh, uh, officers in, uh, in the exile government and also a lot of scholars. And, uh, they decided that this is for the best of different people as well as uh, the Chinese people. <laughs> 藏人行政中央，你们通常所别人所所说的西藏流亡政府的政策立场，就是中间到来寻求解决西藏问题。Uh, and therefore, ever since 1974, it has been the policy of the uh, what's commonly known as the Tibetan government in exile, the central government of uh, uh, Tibet, uh, Tibetans in exile, um, that. Uh, that to, uh, to follow the, the middle way uh, approach and not to seek independence. Now, we need to understand when we talk about the middle way, we need to understand the two ways to understand the middle way. The middle way is 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 the middle way. 统治下的西藏，那中间道路所说的是，我们既不去争取西藏历史上的地位，又无法接受目前中国统治下的西藏的项目，那我们采取中间路线。那个中间路线就是，如果西藏能够获得真正的自治，这也主要是为了保护西藏独特的独特的文化。如果我们能够获得真正的自治，我们西藏愿意留在中华人民共和国，这就是中间道路的基本思想。Um, in a nutshell, to understand the middle way uh, policy, uh, you have to uh, understand the, the arguments from both sides, from the historical argument, uh, which is the support of uh, this, uh, independence, and also the, the Chinese government's argument, which is uh, that the, the Tibet has been under uh, uh, Chinese control. Um, however, uh, the Dalai Lama's uh, middle way approach is not to um, uh, um, not to do, uh, not to seek separation uh, because uh, historically Tibet has been independent 
but also at the same time, is not to follow uh, entirely uh, what the Chinese government uh, what the Ch Chinese government wants uh, to uh, to to do with uh, Tibet. Uh, but is to, uh, this middle way approach, uh, in a sense, is to uh, a way to try to uh, protect uh, and pre preserve uh, Tibetan culture. Uh, and uh, traditions uh, under the Chinese uh, regime, current regime, and to seek a meaningful uh, autonomy. Uh, and the second issue uh, that was in dispute was 
uh, that the Chinese government said that there was already autonomy in, in, uh, in, in the Tibetan communities in China. Uh, there is a Tibetan autonomous region, there is uh, autonomous or smaller autonomous regions in Sichuan, Qinghai, uh, and uh, Gansu. Uh, and therefore, uh, there is, however, the, the Tibetan uh, government's uh, response was that uh, it's not a real, real meaningful uh, autonomy. So, in general, the Jewish, why is it that we have been facing this kind of attack? And these are the two main reasons why the dialogue uh, between us and the Beijing government uh, has uh, yielded no meaningful results. So, in the I think uh, this is a little uh, sort of summary of the uh, of a conceptual understanding of what the middle way approach is, uh, and, and it's uh, sufficient for this uh, uh, conference. And um, uh, and also, like right now, uh, even though with the dialogue uh, we've had difficulties with the dialogue with uh, the Chinese government, however, our uh, our stance has not changed. Uh, so his holiness has always been very uh, concerned uh, with uh, you know, the dialogue with the uh, Han Chinese and uh, it has been the policy of uh, the, the Tibetan government uh, to uh, keep the dialogue going with uh, the Chinese. Now, uh, I am very concerned the I feel very happy and very encouraged uh, because right now there has been increasingly more uh, understanding whether it be in China, in China or overseas uh, that more and more people started to uh, learn more about uh, uh, the Tibet issue and to understand more of the situation. I feel very happy and encouraged. And uh, in the past eight years of my service, a lot of uh, friends that are here today uh, has uh, provided a lot of support, and I want to use this opportunity to thank them uh, for their support. Jinghe 我也愿意借这个机会向您表示感谢。I'm um, also I feel also very happy that there is a lot of uh, young Tibetans uh, that are here today, and including Mr. Uh, Tso Chung Gyatso, uh, that he uh, organized today's event, uh, and he is the new generation of uh, leadership within the Tibetan um, uh, government, and I would like to thank him for his service. 那我也要求各位也希望各位年轻的孩子在有机会的过程当中都了解西藏尤其是一九五九年之后到底在西藏里面遇到了什么样的苦难遭遇今天在这里讲的话
，由于时间问题不够，但是我愿意推荐几本书。第一，李佳明女士写的《一九五九拉萨》，那个时候到底在西藏发生什么事情？一一位独立学者的身份，有一本书《一九五九拉萨》。And also,、uh, I also want to invite、uh, the young、uh, Han Chinese friends to learn more about、uh, Tibet and also what actually happened after the year of 1959. And there's a, a list of books that I would like to recommend、uh, for people who are interested.、Uh, one of the, the first book is、uh, the book written by Ms. Jiangmin Li in here.、Um, uh, it's called.、Uh, 1959. Last. 1959. Last. 那我把这个书名呃稍微说一下，也估计完全完全由于时间的问题。一本是一九五九拉萨，那还有一本是当天鸟飞向天空。在当天鸟天空飞行。还有一本书是那个这个叫什么来？资深记者北京写的。呃，藏族出中国，藏族出中国。呃，还有一本是，呃，那个《西藏秘辛记》，那个是，呃，江里边，丁先生去西藏的时候，到底他们的那个所见所闻，把它记录下来。还有刚刚下面就是讲到那个高山流水，论论西藏。如果更进一步去认识达赖喇嘛尊者，他通常做的三大使命 ：Twin Commitment， 他身为一名人，推动人类普世价值；身为一名佛教徒，有义务要推动各宗教之间的和谐；身为一名有达赖喇嘛的头衔，而且是扮演一种最有经历西藏人的代言人，我有义务。要保护西藏宗教、文化、环境。那这三个思想，如果再去了解的话，就是刚刚那个电影中的智慧之海，达赖喇嘛跟当代科学的这样的对话。还有一本书《生命幸福的生幸福生命之道》，比较特别讲。这几本书，如果继续看的话，那对于西藏一定会有更深的认识。所以。呃，我再次感谢呢。呃，最后我也不是笑话，呃，是一是一个真实情况。我讲这句话，然后呃，我的发言做一个结语。呃，我有一位认识的中国学生，在加州，我我没有必要点他的名字。那我们后来成为很好的朋友。那他曾经，我把像刚刚这些人，我对你们说的。以及我对外面说的内容全部是一样的。如果各位去打开明细，或许有很多采访。我不是这里说一套，那里说一套，我说的全部是不一样。那这位中国学生，我也解释了刚刚类似这样的情况。那他说他在大陆的时候，他以为打赖集团是一个非常肮脏的公司。因为他不了解，他集团，他一听集团，他认为这是一个比较不好的公司，所以说这就是体现了，因为一个人在没有去了解各种信息的时候，蒙蔽在一个某种程度上，所以呃，透过这样的这个这个我们对话，呃，我相信呃各位对西藏有所帮助。如果各位对西藏有帮助。这个其实对我们藏人是很大的。你们了解，然后把真相告诉中国人的时候，你藏人讲一句话，或者讲一百话，你们讲的一句话是来源笑话，但是这个话呢，要讲真话，不能断下去。那我再次谢谢各位，今天能够在这里。
uh, there was a few other books written by this, uh, uh, Mr. Ding and also Ms. Uh, uh, Zhang Li uh, and also uh, Ms. Uh, Professor Xia. Um, these are all uh, very good books uh, for Chinese students to, uh, to get to know more about Tibet and uh, the, the situation. Uh, um, so um, there, there are three things uh, that uh, His Holiness uh, the Dalai Lama that he was committed to in his life. One is as a human being. He wants to uh, promote uh, human values, uh, universal human values. And number two, he is a, he's a he, uh, number two, he is a, a Buddhist monk, um, and uh, he is committed to he is committed to promote uh, religious harmony, uh, interface. Uh, religious uh, harmony uh, in all over the world. And number three, he is uh, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. He's the leader of Tibetan people, and uh, he is uh, committed to protect uh, the culture, uh, uh, the, the religion, as well as the environment in Tibet. Um, uh, uh, 二零一九年或者二零二零年在工作计划里面因为胡平先生学了很多关于西南的所以这些文章又收集起来如果变成一本书的话对年轻人以及研究西藏的研究者很有帮助所以这是我的一个主题那最后，谢谢珊珊小姐。